Welcome, my friends, to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm Casey Gomez, and I'm thrilled you're joining me today for a fun conversation with a passionate author. We're kicking off the program like it's our tradition with a short reading from the feature book. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Hey, my name is Randy Lee Boslaw, and I am the author of Goodbye Too Soon. I'm going to be reading starting in the first chapter. Chapter one, the phone call. It had been two weeks since I had last spoken to my brother, Brandon. Before that, it was six months, and before that, years. Unfortunately, I didn't speak with him as much as I would have liked, but it was a necessary part of maintaining healthy boundaries. It was May 20th, 2021. I parked my car, put on my mask, and got in line outside the pool store before seeing one of my personal training clients. I planned to make a quick stop to check the water quality of my pool. There was a longer line than I expected, but it was pool opening season. I took my phone out of my pocket and scrolled mindlessly on Facebook when I noticed I'd missed a call from Aunt C. That, in and of itself, is not weird. I talked to Aunt C on the phone several times a week. She called me again before I had a chance to call her back. Randy. Hello? Aunt C. Hi, did you see on Facebook that someone said Brandon is dead? Randy. What? What are you talking about? Aunt C. They called me and told me she saw a post claiming that your brother is dead. Randy. Okay, well, that has happened before and it wasn't true, so I doubt it's true this time. Aunt C. Can you look? I looked at my phone and noticed a message from my brother's girlfriend, Katrina. Katrina's message. Hey, can you please call your mom? Your brother is gone. He overdosed and passed away today. I spoke to the cops and I've been trying to call your mom. I guess forensics are still there doing what they need to do. And it happened at such and such address. Please get your mom to call me at this number. I'm freaking out and I can't stop bawling my eyes out. After reading that message, I was nearly out of words. I sat on the curb, still in line to get to the store and told my aunt I needed to call her back because Katrina had sent me this message. After hanging up with Aunt C, I called Katrina. Katrina. Hello? Randy. Okay, what happened? Katrina. Sophia from the Streetworks program called and told me that Brandon is dead. She said that the person with Brandon called her, saying he wasn't waking up. Sophia drove to the address and called 911 on her way. When she got there, she said that she tried to use naloxin to revive him, but it didn't work. I started to cry. How could this be real? I always had an awful feeling that I would get a call like this, but I was still shocked and upset. Nothing about the conversation felt real. I kept thinking that it must be a cruel joke. Randy, are you sure? Katrina, yes, I was able to talk to the police on the scene on the phone to give them your mom's number, but no one can get a hold of her. Randy, she was at work and will be in the car driving home now. She won't see any missed calls until she gets home and checks her cell phone. Katrina, can you tell her what I told you? Randy, of course. Can you give me Sophia's number? I need to talk to her. Katrina, Yes, I will send it through Messenger. Randy, thank you. Katrina, I am so sorry. Randy, thanks, bye. As I hung up the phone, Aunt C called again. I was slightly annoyed that she didn't give me a chance to investigate the news before calling again. Though, I think deep down, she already knew the truth. Randy, hello? Aunt C, any news? Randy, I just hung up with Katrina. She told me it's true, and he's gone. She gave me Sophia's number. She was there and tried to revive him. I will call her right now and I will call you back. Aunt C. Okay. I hung up, took a few deep breaths, and called Sophia. Sophia. Hello? Randy. Hi, this is Brandon's sister, Randy. Katrina gave me your number. Sophia. Hi, Randy. I am so sorry. I tried to revive him, but he was already gone by the time I got here. Randy. Can you tell me what happened? Sophia. The person with your brother tried to wake him up, but couldn't. He called me and I drove over. I called 911 on my way. When I got there, I gave him naloxone, but it didn't help. There was nothing I could do. I am so, so sorry. I tried. With Sophia retelling the tragic events leading up to Brandon's death, I could no longer hold back my tears, and they came streaming down my cheeks. I kept my sunglasses on to hide them from those around me. Randy, are you still there? Sophia, yes. Did you want to talk to the officer? Randy, yes, please. I need to hear it from them. I heard wrestling as Sophia passed the phone to an officer. I held my breath, hoping the officer would tell me it was all a horrible joke. Officer. Hello? Randy. Hi, this is Brandon's sister. 
I wanted to know what happened. The officer. I'm sorry, but your brother has passed away. We've been trying to call your mom. Randy. I'll tell her. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Inside the Minds of Authors. I hope you guys are ready for this interview because that reading just touched my soul. If you're new to the podcast, make sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss a single episode. We have new authors every Monday night with amazing books. So we're going to get started. Hello, dear. How are you? I am good. I'm a little after reading, but I'm good. <laughs> this is one of those books that goes Oh, so we need to start from the beginning. Give us the background. Where did this book and why did you decide to write it? Where did it come from? It came from my brother's death. So it is a nonfiction. It is a complete truth of how I remember how things went down. So when I say I was standing in line during COVID, that's exactly where I was. After my brother had died and going through all the emotions of grieving and, and figuring out why he died, so a senseless death, really. Being an author, writing has always helped. So I started writing my thoughts down. It started with poetry. That's mostly how I get my emotions out. And then I thought, his death can't mean nothing. And that sentence kept playing over and over and over in my mind. And I thought, you know what? His death doesn't have to mean nothing. It can still help people because he always loved helping people. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to put it all together and hopefully send it out there in the world. And hopefully it will help somebody. This is a really powerful book because you're bringing back all these emotions every time you read them. The fact that you reread this passage and having to get back in that place. How long did it take you to put this book together? I'm going to say, so once he died in May, it probably took me about six months before I started writing it. And then another probably about a year to write it all out. So it came out on the two-year anniversary of his death. This year will be three-year anniversary coming up and the one-year anniversary of having the book out. Putting together a nonfiction and trying to make it so people can embrace death and be able to heal. What was your message through this all? The book was written for families of those who have loved ones going through an addiction. A lot of books that I've read on addiction are written to the person who is in their addiction or is trying to recover from it. This one is very much towards the family and how when you lose somebody with addiction, even if they aren't actually dead, I mean, I lost my brother long before his death. It really is how I view it. So it's written to them about how our grieving process is probably going to be a little bit different than, say, if you lose a grandparent who, you know, is in their 90s who has lived a good life, a very long life. It's a very different grieving process. There's a grieving process of, could I have done something different? Absolutely not. I can't fix what was wrong with him. He had a mental illness. But there is that process of, could I have done something wrong? Could I have said something differently? What could I have done to make him better? So it just speaks about boundaries, laying those boundaries, forgiving ourselves, forgiving the person, because he didn't wake up and go, you know, it'd be a great idea if I overdose today. That is absolutely not what happened. He woke up and whatever was going through his mind was just too much for him. And he did drugs. And that ultimately led to his death. So there's a lot of forgiveness as a big theme and boundaries. You mentioned forgiving yourself. And I think sometimes as going through this process, we tend to say, yes, we forgive the person, but we don't forgive ourselves. And we have this guilt and we have this shame and we have these things that we keep carrying and projecting. So how long did it take you, and I'm going a little personal here, for you to heal and for you to forgive yourself and your brother? So for me, probably about a year after his death, probably about six months into writing the book, I feel like for me, I'm in a different spot than, say, my cousin who was really affected or, or my mom, because I have a lot of psychology background. And I have my, my own YouTube show where I've talked to so many people about addiction. When I was in college, I did a placement at a drug and alcohol recovery house. So I have a very different background than some other people who were grieving. So the forgiveness, yeah, it took time because it is definitely very emotional. Even though in my head, I knew it 
my heart didn't necessarily know it. So it did take some time. But I think if I wouldn't have had that knowledge that, again, he didn't wake up and choose to go do this. It was a mental illness that he couldn't overcome, that he couldn't get the proper help for. If I didn't actually know that, I think it would have taken a lot longer. Healing is a process different for everyone to our listeners. This is one of those lessons of wherever you are in your life, let it be and embrace it and go with it. Because sometimes I think we try to rush it. Yeah. And we're trying to make it better now without going through the process of truly understanding what is happening. As you've been promoting the book and sharing the book with everybody else, what has been some of the reactions from listeners? So far, all the reactions have been very positive. I get a lot of, I read the book and it made me cry, which... Thank you. (laughs) And from people who are listening to the different podcasts I'm on as I'm promoting it, there is a lot of, wow, this is a hard topic. Wow, I didn't realize these certain things. So I I think it's had a very positive impact for those who have been listening. And so far, it's been mostly, holy moly, wow, that's that's a lot. (laughs) It's a combination opener because sometimes like, how do you open this? How do you start? How do you bring this into the foreground? It's like, Hey, we should talk about people be like, what? We're talking about what? Right, exactly. And there was a long period in my life where I didn't talk about this stuff. So my brother was four years older than me. So he was into drugs and doing all this stuff when he was, my earliest memory of it, he was 14, probably about 14, 15. And so growing up, you didn't talk about it. If that was happening in the house, my brother being addicted to drugs, going in and out of jail, we didn't talk about it. And so it took me a long time into, I mean, I'm in my 30s now, and now I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to not talk about it because if somebody else is going through it and they're feeling the same way I did, then they need to know that it's okay to talk about it or at least to not have to hide. You know, you don't have to be like me and going and telling the entire world, but if you need to talk to a close friend, like I didn't even tell my friends what were happening, like my best friends, Mm -mm, you didn't tell nobody. I didn't talk to my aunt about it. I didn't talk to my cousins who I was super close to. Actually, some of the stuff that I've written in not just this book, but some of the other books my cousin has read and went, and I was really close to my cousin going up. He goes, wow, I didn't realize all that stuff. I actually feel bad for being mad at you when you would sleep over on the weekends. Because he was like, you're invading my space. Get out. Because he was younger than me by a couple of years. Get out of my space. And now he's reading the book and he's an adult. And he's like, wow, okay. You know, I, I feel bad now for that. Well, it all makes sense. And they're able to put the pieces together and go and that's what's happening behind the scenes. So it is amazing the fact that you're creating a book for others to connect. Because sometimes, let's be honest, we don't want to share everything with everybody. Exactly. And there's still pieces of my life that I don't share because, I mean, I'm still sort of a private person. I'll say sort of because there's not too much. But I'm going to say there's parts of my story that involve other people so I don't feel that I can share them because it's too much involving other people and that's their story not mine if it's strictly mine then I share it if I feel like it but I don't want to share something that somebody else hasn't given me permission to share because when they are ready they will do what they feel is necessary it is such a beautiful learning process that you have created and given something amazing to people to be able to say I'm not alone and take that breath and be able to connect And be able to do it safely because I think safe and be able to heal is huge. Yeah, exactly. You have to pick and choose who you're going to talk to because sometimes you're right. You're not safe talking to certain people because there are some people out there that they will take your pain and use it against you. And that's, I mean, that's awful, but it happens. So you do need to be careful, protect yourself, protect your emotions. And that's why there are paid professionals, but you don't necessarily have to go to a professional, but that's why they exist so that there is always a safe person that you can go and talk to. Ideally, you're going to have at least a friend or a family member that will also be a safe person, but some people don't have that. We're getting in a society that is very difficult, probably because we're so separated and we only see bits and pieces from social media. Yeah. So this is a great book as a resource. I really like the fact that it's for the families, because like you said, Who is talking to the families? Who's understanding that they're suffering as much as the other person? Yeah, exactly. Another big reason I did that, I mean, other than the fact that I was writing it from my perspective and I'm the family was that when I did my placement back in college, I mean, this is going back a decade now, but I still remember 
it, so it was a male drug and alcohol recovery house. So I still remember some of the guys talking about how they were hurting so bad because their family wouldn't come visit them. And I would say, you're right. And you know why? Because they're protecting themselves. Because at that time, my brother was, you know, he was doing drugs still. And I had already said, I'm not talking to you. If this is how you're going to be, I'm not. I would empathize with them. But ultimately, your family is protecting themselves. You get clean. And by all means, your family will probably start talking to you again. But I totally understand why they're choosing not to do it right now. It's not to hurt you. It's to protect themselves. Sometimes we make people feel guilty and bad and selfish for protecting themselves. Yes. But going through that roller coaster of emotions over and over is just as damaging to everybody in that ecosystem. Exactly. And something that my brother always used to say when, if he would talk to us, like my mom or me, especially my mom, because my mom answered the phone far more often than I did when he would call, because he would call her right at work too, because if she wouldn't answer her phone, what other option did he have other than to really harass her at work is really what he was doing. She actually got in trouble at one point at work saying, you're on too many personal calls. She's like, well, I'm not meaning to, I'm not making them out. They're coming to me. But he would call her and, and say, can I have $20 or whatever it was? And it would be no, no, no. And as soon as you would say no to something, there would be this instant switch from this sweet, oh, can you do me a favor, please? When I miss you. And then it was no to, well, you and, and, and you know, swearing and, and calling names because they didn't get what they want. That is such an interesting perspective because sometimes people don't see those switches in personalities. It's a little bit manipulative. Oh, it's 100%. controlling. Yeah. But it's also emotional blackmail. So I am so excited that you're pointing this out because sometimes I think family members don't know how to cope. And you said boundaries. How important were boundaries for you? They are my saving grace, I would say, because growing up, I would say from the time I was about 10 up until 2021, something like that, there was that fear that I lived in of, I don't know what the reaction's going to be. I would come home sometimes and my room would be a disaster because he looked for money or he knew people who actually robbed us, not once, not at one house, not at two houses, at three separate houses that we lived in. He knew people that came and stole from us. And if you've ever had your house robbed, uh, it, it's not just, hey, my stuff is gone. It's you went through my underwear drawer. Like this is personal. This is a horrific feeling when somebody tosses your entire life upside down like that. You're not safe in your own home. So when I was on my own, finally, the boundaries are what saved me because I said, no, you're not going to know where I live. Absolutely not. After having my stuff taken from me, because like the video camera that had my kids first steps on, gone, right? It's, it's not something you'll ever see again. I have my memories, but it's not something that I can ever see. And I was lucky enough to actually be able to have filmed it, right? And so it's this idea that I'm not safe anymore. So no, you're not going to know where I live. And I'm not going to let you see my kid because you're not a safe and trustworthy person at this time. So boundaries really saved me, especially as I was working through my emotions. And it did take time before I went to therapy and started talking about them as well. And that really helped. But boundaries are what I went, okay, I can feel safe in my home now. And that was huge. This is such an important key for everyone listening. And going through this is your safety and your mental state is such a huge part of dealing with this situation because yes, we want to save, we want to help, we want to heal the other person, but at what cost your own sanity is that going to be? So I'm glad you're talking about this and sharing it with people who are probably feeling guilty, like I should do more. Exactly. For a long time, I thought, okay, I'm going to do more. I want to help. I want to help. And at one point, this is going way back. This is before I finished college. I was in college, so I still didn't really know much about mental health in general because I was still taking courses. And he said, I want to get clean. I said, okay, this is it. I'm going to help you. I'm going to do it. So, okay, come to my house. I lived in a different city. And I said, okay, you're going to stay here. You're not going to be able to get anything because you don't know anybody. That that was my idea. If you can't get to the drugs, you can't do the drugs, and that will solve the problem. 
that's not how it works because there's underlying issues. Addiction is a mental illness. So he came, he did well for about a week and then New Year's Eve hit. Well, in his mind, I have to go out and going out equaled I have to drink. And he kept saying, I don't have a drinking problem. I have a drug problem. Well, once you drink, then you want to do drugs. So it, it's a vicious cycle and there is absolutely nothing I could have done to stop it. But in my mind, in my very young mind, because I was early 20s, it was, okay, but you're here. So why can't you just be here? Like, why do you have to go? You don't have to go. out. Like, I could not wrap my head around it. And now as I've learned more, it's, okay, it is a mental illness. And so you couldn't change that because you weren't getting the help that you needed as well. But I thought I could help. And once I finally learned that I did not have the power to change him, that's when I was able to really enforce the boundaries. But that is a very hard thing to do because all you want to do is help. Like all I ever wanted was my brother back. And so when he died, one of the biggest things was I'll never have him back. The hope of ever having him back is gone. But that's why I said, yeah, sure, I'll help you. But that's not what he needed. Even though I wanted to, it's not what he needed. And that's what a lot of us want to do. We want to put ourselves out there. We want to help them. We want to do what we can. But if they are not willing to seek proper help, there's nothing we can do. We're not the professionals. Oh, Miss Randy, this is such a powerful conversation and segment. And my heart is just like, oof, you're a very, very strong person. And I've gone through this. I'm so close with my brothers. It's just the thought of losing them and going through this process just breaks my heart. So I so appreciate that you being so open with us and sharing this information. I want to know before you go switching gears a little bit, you mentioned about your other works. Can you tell us a little bit about that before you go? Sure. So I've written some other nonfiction books. I wrote my first one way back in 2017, actually. And it's a collection of poems that I wrote when I was a teenager and I was depressed. After that, I wrote a book about raising my kid with autism. I like to say we're living through it will be part two. Uh, so that one goes from when I was pregnant right up until grade six. So it's really good for the younger ages there. And then I wrote about an actual novel about my depression and went more into the coping strategies and therapy and what worked for me and maybe it will work for you. Try some different things. So I wrote that one just a couple of years ago. And then I've written some kids books because when you write really heavy topics like I do, I need to lighten it up. <laughs> and so I've done a few different kids books. The The most recent one was about my three-legged cat. I actually do have a three-legged cat and his name is Neo. And so I wrote a book. It's called Neo's Forever Home and it's about him and how he actually came to live with us. And I drew the pictures myself for that book because I just, again, it was after Goodbye Too Soon and I just... I needed to lighten it up. I don't promote my kids' books very much. I really promote my mental health stuff, but it's just I do those for me. And, you know, sometimes people find them awesome too. <laughs> Absolutely love your journey. Love the fact that you're documenting it and sharing it because that as a whole is very rare and very hard. Most of us want to keep things as private as possible. You have taken the approach of I'm here, I'm going to help heal, and I'm going to share. So kudos to you, dear. Thank you. With that in mind. What advice would you give to an up-and-coming author who has this passion as well and they want to put it out there? What would you tell them? Write for yourself and your audience will come. That's a really, really fun advice. I like it. So, Madam, tell us, where can our listeners find you when they can learn more about the books? Where are you located online? So, my website is rbwriting.ca. And then I'm on Facebook at RB Writing. I am on Instagram and TikTok at Randy Lee Boslaw. And all my books are available on Amazon. You can find her anywhere, dear listeners. So absolutely. So dear, are you ready for the lightning round? You said we're going to lighten it up a little before you leave us. So let's try it. Ooh, good. <laughs> okay. Caffeinated or decaf drinks? Usually decaf. Okay. Pancakes or waffles? Waffles. Skiing or swimming? Swimming. Android or Apple? Android. Here's a little different. Let's see how you do with this one. If your life had a theme song, what would it be? Ooh, I don't know names of songs very well. I guess It's My Life is the only song coming to my mind right now, so I'm going to go with that one. We'll take it. That's a good one. Yeah. Dear, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and sharing. 
do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, if you're going through any kind of a struggle, find a safe person to talk to, whether that be a friend, family, professional, find somebody safe or listen to different podcasts where we're talking about that stuff. If that's the only other option that you have, that's why we talk about it. That's why we're here. I love it. Listeners, go ahead, check out Ms. Randy, check out the website, the podcast, get connected. And if you are needing assistance, go find a professional, go find a dear friend. There is resources out there to take full advantage. But I'm like you, so a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. And Thank everyone, you for having me. A pleasure. It's a deep conversation that needs to happen. So I appreciate it. To our listeners, make sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss a single episode. We have amazing authors and we'll be back next Monday with another one. Bye.